Great. Hi, welcome everybody. This is uh, Jaka Dorgos. Very happy to be hosting uh, this session with uh, Nityanand Jairam and a range of distinguished panelists. Uh, facilitating the session with me is Chiku Agarwal, uh, Engagement Associate, Associate, and myself, Jacob Cherian, Director of Engagement. We're very happy to be here, especially Jakarta has many personal roots within Korea Canal itself. And uh, we're over to you, Nitena Jaram. Uh, and we're going to step back. Feel free to uh, ping us for anything. We're here. Uh, questions in chat, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob and Chiku and Jakka. Uh, my name is Nityanand Jairavan. I'm a journalist and a social activist based in Chennai. And I have been associated with the campaign in Kodai Canal for the last uh, 21 years, unfortunately. Um, I have today a presentation that I'm going to share with you. So I'm going to take you on down the memory lane. Okay. Yeah, so with a little bit of history of uh, the Unilever's entry into Kodekanan and what has transpired over the last 30, uh, 21 years. Uh, actually, um, it's more like uh, 40 years. Uh, Unilever came into India in 1983. But before that, like all good stories, the story actually begins in the United States of America, uh, where the predecessor of Unilever, a company called Chesbro Ponds, operated a mercury thermometer factory on the banks of a river called Black River that emptied into one of the Great Lakes, the Lake Ontario. This was in upstate New York uh, in the United States. Uh, the 1970s, after the 1960s, and the 1970s were a time of a lot of environmental awakening in the US when they realized the dangers of chemicals that had uh, given them the prosperity, the post-World War II chemical boom. And mercury is one of the targeted chemicals that was seen as a transboundary pollutant, which means the mercury was so dangerous that it not only polluted the local area, but also crossed national boundaries. And so America and Canada got together uh, with something called the International Joint Commission on the Great Lakes, because the Great Lakes were a tremendous stress because of mercury pollution. And uh, decided to strictly regulate mercury discharges into the atmosphere and the environment. As a result of tightening regulations, this factory, the thermometer factory in uh, Ontario, in, in, in uh, New York, was shut down. And if you look at the uh, slide that I have presented, all the red slides, uh, all the red dots present hotspots. And the one, the red dot in the northern part of the map is uh, uh, Black River, it's a place called Watertown uh, in New York where the factory existed. Even as recently as 2009, mercury broken thermometers washed up on the banks of Black River. And one assumes that this must come from the thermometer factory there. In any case, this factory was shut down and a secondhand thermometer factory was sent to India, to Kodekana. When it came here in Kodekanal, of course, the people of Kodekanal were overjoyed because it was a sleepy little tourist town um, with nothing much in terms of industries. And the industry was seen to be uh, to, to bring with it the promise of employment and prosperity. When they came here, they decided to set up in what was largely a residential area uh, in a place called St. Mary's Road in Kodekanal, which is on top of the hill. It's a ridge. On the southern side of the ridge is the Pambar Shola forest. Uh, Shola is a very special uh, you know, um, forest ecosystem that Robin will talk about, Professor Robin uh, will talk about uh, in the next presentation. And on the other side of the ridge is the Kodekanan Lake. When they set up over here, they did not disclose that this was a factory that was shut down in the United States uh, for environment, probably because of environment environmental regulation. They brought it in as a glass thermometer, as a glass factory, and which is considered to be non-polluting, and hence was allowed in the midst of a residential area and sandwiched between two extremely ecologically sensitive 
uh, spaces, the Bombay Shola on the, on the southern, on the northern side, and the Pambar Shola on the southern slopes. In 2001, uh, the people of Kodekanal, primarily there were people from an organization called Paldi Hills Conservation Council, and one of the key members of it, Navros Modi, detected that there were broken thermometers lying inside a scrapyard in a very crowded part of Kodekanal and decided to uh, set off an investigation. I was part of the initial investigation in December 2000. And in March 2001, the people of Kodekanal, along with former workers from the factory, marched from the scrapyard to the factory site and demanded its closure. The factory was shut down and within um, by, by the Pollution Control Board, which uncharacteristically had a very straightforward and efficient officer at the helm. And uh, after it was closed down, Unilever conducted a study. It is called a ma mercury mass balance. So mercury mass balance is very simple. It is like a budget. It's an accounting of how much mercury came into the factory and how much mercury went out of the factory in the form of finished thermometers, in the form of broken thermometers, or is lying inside the family, in, inside the factory in the form of scrap or waste, and how much of it has been discharged to the environment. This is a balancing exercise in which the right-hand side of the equation will have to be equal to the left-hand side of the equation. And <clears throat> the left-hand side being the inputs and the right-hand side being the outputs. So in 2001, when they did the mass balance, they discovered that the unaccounted for mercury was about 559 kilograms, which is a lot of mercury because mercury is very poisonous. Even one gram of mercury deposited per year over a 20 acre, 20 acre lake can contaminate all the fish in the lake to make it too poisonous for human consumption. So they accounted and said that we, we have probably discharged only about 559 kilograms. But however, the workers from the factory pointed out that the company had failed to account for 10 tons of mercury in the input side, which means all of a sudden now we have 10 more tons that needed to be accounted. And Unilever got its accountants to work on it. And the numbers were all shuffled. They increased the number of thermometers exported by about 100,000. They increased the amount of mercury in the thermometers by a small quantity from 0 0.66 to 0 0.72. And thereby, they managed to explain away close to nine tons of the unaccounted mercury. Now, this is pure accounts number juggling. This makes the entire exercise extremely fraught and unreliable. In any case, these are the only numbers we have because neither the Pollution Control Board of Tamil Nadu or the Central Pollution Control Board have bothered to verify any of these numbers. According to the 2002 study of Unilever, which is a juggled study, close to two tons of mercury is unaccounted for, which means lying inside the factory, discharged into the Pambar Shola, discharged on the Bombay Shola Kodekanal uh, Lake watershed. And by all accounts, even though the workers and uh, people like myself feel that there is a gross underestimate, two tons of mercury in the environment is extremely dangerous. Mercury is so poisonous that it has warranted uh, a dedicated United Nations Convention to uh, reduce with the aim of eliminating all mercury discharges. It is called the Minamata Convention, and India is a signatory to that convention. So this is the second deception. The first one being bringing a second-hand factory into India. The second deception is how they juggled numbers in order to explain away extremely high unaccounted losses to the environment. Um, studies after studies have been done since 2001. Not a single study by the Pollution Control Board or the government of Tamil Nadu or even the government of India. They've all been done by Unilever, its consultants, paid consultants, including a notorious agency called NIRI, and by non-governmental or um, uh, other private laboratories, including the Department of Atomic Energy's laboratory in Hyderabad. Now, all these um, samples indicate that there are very high and levels of concern, uh, that is the mercury levels in various media are uh, at or above levels of concern. Notable among them were uh, uh, a series of uh, tests on fish that were caught from the Plains region. So mercury has a behavior where 
it when it enters the aquatic environment it changes form in the sediment it, it is acted upon by microorganisms and it changes form from an elemental or an ionic form into a more toxic methylated or an organic form and this organic form is bioavailable and can build up in the food chain uh, so fish were found to have levels of concern the sediment in the lake and the sediment inside the pamar shola have been found to have consistently high levels of mercury and for sediments the levels of mercury that should concern us will be anything above 0.17 milligrams per kilogram milligram per kilogram means if i take 1 kilogram of soil if it has more than 0.17 milligrams of mercury in that kilogram then that is at the threshold of the level of concern um I'm fast forwarding now to uh, 2021. In between, there was uh, in 2015, despite all kinds of campaigning uh, tactics and strategies and efforts by people, especially the workers from Kodekanal, to get compensation for health damages and to get the place cleaned up, uh, Unilever successfully staved off all uh, you know, <clears throat> criticism, especially by managing media. Unilever is one of the biggest advertisers. Um, in 2015, we decided to bypass the mainstream media and we took to social media with a uh, song called Kodekanal Won't, which summarized the troubles of uh, Kodekanal. And that song was, of course, hosted on the Jatka website. It was a collaboration between the people of Kodekanal, which is primarily the former workers, uh, Chennai Solidarity Group and Jatka. The song went viral and it was through a rap song that Kodekanal's workers got justice, not because of the government of India, not because of the courts, not because of the government of Tamil Nadu or the Pollution Control Board. It is just the workers, their solidarity and a viral rap song that brought Unilever to settle with the workers. So one aspect of the issue was settled where about 593 workers got a comfortable settlement and could return to their lives after having spent uh, decades with ill health and about a decade and a half fighting Unilever. Um, cleanup was still an issue. And the company has promised what is a substandard seed cleanup with the help of agencies like NIRI. And in, two, in, in January 2020, the company did something that made bad things worse. Uh, the factory, as I said, is located on a slope. So what you see called a La Salette church and the long uh, kind of a roof, that is a factory. And on the southern side is a very steep slope that goes to the Periculum Plains and the Madurai Plains. And this southern slope is drained by a stream called Pambar Stream, which joins the river Vaigai uh, in the plains. So every drop of water that is not absorbed by the soil inside the factory will flow off into the, um, in, 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 into the watershed below. And we have Professor Jagdish Krishnaswamy, who is a forest hydrologist, who will be talking to us about rainwater flow and what it means for the um, uh, for the forest below because rain always moves with sediment. So vegetative cover, like what we have over here in, within the white line, a dense vegetation, this offers three levels of protection. You have the canopy, which uh, you know retards the uh, velocity of the rainfall, and then you have undergrowth, and then you have the leaf litter. So you have three layers of protection for the soil. And so the rain, by the time it reaches the soil, comes down very slowly, and there is very little uh, rainwater flow when you have a thickly, densely vegetated area. Um, in 2020, without permissions from anybody, despite the fact that the factory is located barely 300 meters from the Kodaikanal Wildlife Sanctuary, the company did this. It removed 425 uh, trees, fully grown trees, from the factory site, exposing the highly contaminated mercury soils to the elements. What this means is something that will be explained by Jagdish Krishnaswamy. Uh, what I would like to leave you with before we move on to uh, Robin is that the factory site is currently being cleaned to make it suitable for human habitation. Humans do not eat leaf litter. They do not feed on earthworms. And they might be at the top of the food chain, but a person who is living on the factory site is likely to be less exposed than the other wondrous animals and plants and uh, microorganisms and birds that inhabit this. Here I have uh, a slide which shows 
a shield tail snake, which is again uh, something that is found in the Pambar Shola in the Palni Hills. And the beautiful bird that you see over there, and I'm hoping that uh, Robin will talk a little bit more about it, is a uh, yellow bellied Sholakili. And Sholakilis are tiny, but don't let their size fool you. They are quite the rowdy in that neighborhood, can attack and eat even small baby uh, shield tail snakes. They, are, uh, they eat the cicadas, which grow in the ground and spend about between two and 17 years buried in the soil. And if that soil has mercury, then the cicadas take on that mercury and give a deadly accumulated load of toxins to the unsuspecting Sholaki. So the Pambar Shola is now, thanks to Unilever, full of toxic food chains, like the one that I expo ex explained before. In 2021, uh, NIRI, that is just a few days ago, NIRI submitted um, a report uh, which assessed the uh, mercury contamination off-site, which means outside the factory site. And NIRI's findings, the findings, which means the data, suggests that all is not well. The levels of mercury in the sediment are far above the safe levels. The levels of mercury found, I'm talking about inside the sanctuary, inside the Pambar Shola, the levels of mercury in the soil are about 470 times what, uh, what is naturally occurring in other parts of the Pambar Shola. The level that was found in moss, which is growing on a tree right next to a stream that comes out of the factory site, had levels of mercury that was about 795 times higher than background levels. So all this should cause us concern. But Neri's conclusion is that all is well. I will leave you with this at this point, just to let you know that this has been a history of deception. The people uh, from Kodai Canal uh, do not, I don't know, they do understand the seriousness of it, but data and expertise is being used, is being abused to uh, fool people. I think uh, at this point in time, we need to be very careful about the fate of the mercury entering the Pambar Shola and the Kodai Canal Wildlife Sanctuary. And I think that it is important for uh, scientists with integrity to step in and start informing the future course of action. Thank you. Uh, Robin, it's over to you. Uh, Professor Robin is uh, uh, an ecologist from ISA in Tripati. And uh, uh, I'd be grateful if, and he, he's, he's, be, he's been working in the Palni Hills on a project that he will be talking to you about. And uh, Professor Robin, if there's anything else you'd like to uh, uh, you know, include in your introduction, please do so. Thank you. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, I just uh, quickly, I'll give you a background about uh, where I come from and probably how I fit um, uh, into, this, um, uh, into this discussion. Um, so most of my work has been in the Shola Sky Islands, which are these mountain tops. But before that, I should tell you that you know, I start with a disclaimer that we do not have data on um, mercury and its impact on birds. So at this time, um, all we have is what I can tell you about the birds that inhabit the landscape. And I'm, uh, I also want to tell you about the, the landscape itself uh, and our group. So we don't actually do, a lot of our work is not very applied. It's kind of very blue sky kind of research. Uh, we look at um, uh, birds, their evolution, um, how they got here, uh, you know, what kinds of songs they sing, and if the songs are different in different places, and so on. Uh, some of you can find more information on our website, and we have a fantastic team of uh, uh, students and collaborators uh, who work with us. Uh, we happen to be in Kodai Canal. We've been working in the Kodai Canal landscape for, I think, about. Uh, seven or eight years, uh, uh, almost continuously. And uh, this uh, implies that we now know the birds and uh, the landscape quite well, um, uh, despite not having any data uh, on the mercury. We do know a lot about uh, the birds ecology. And uh, I, I, I will try and provide you a very big overview um, of uh, these birds and why this habitat uh, is actually important and the birds themselves. And of course, I think you don't need to know, uh, I mean, you do, probably don't need an introduction about where the Western Ghats are, that is uh, here. But uh, I just want to highlight uh, the location, you know, Kodai Canal, uh, it's in the Southern Western Ghats, as uh, many of you know, 
And I'm going to take you through a fly through. It's a Google fly through just to appreciate the landscape a little bit. So if you start from the south, uh, you notice that the, the mountain, the Western Ghat mountain, it's a very narrow ridge. Uh, and you can see the dry uh, uh, landscape uh, you know, to the east and the wet towards the uh, uh, west. Uh, you have the Shenkota Gap, which is a prominent barrier. Um, and then uh, this uh, mountain kind of, uh, it kind of becomes a little broad. Um, and, uh, and that is where you have the Kodai Canal uh, up on these hills. This is Munar, Anemudi is here. You have this matrix of forests and grasslands, and then you have the Palghat Gap. And this kind of continues on to uh, Nigris, which is again a very uh, broad uh, uh, mountain, uh, high elevation mountain, okay? And uh, north, uh, north of this, you find very little high elevation uh, uh, mountains. You find only very small isolated hills. Um, so uh, what I wanted to kind of indicate here is that the big mountains, uh, you know, the wide mountains is just the Nilgiris and the Annamalai Palni Hills. And here, because the mountains are very high, uh, you get what are popularly known as cloud forests. Um, so it, it is almost like uh, islands in the sky, you could call them, because they're always wet and cold. Uh, and this kind of results in a very specific uh, microclimate with a lot of moss and, uh, uh, you know, water just dripping off, uh, coming directly from the clouds. Um, so it's a very specific, unique kind of habitat. And we've studied the birds here. A lot of the birds are endemic to these, uh, what are called sky islands, these mountain tops. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did when we, uh, we studied them with, you know, we, we collected some blood samples and looked at their genetics. And we found that this one bird uh, is very interesting. It, this is what uh, uh, Nityanand was uh, referring to, the Sholikola. It used to be uh, you know, called the short wing, uh, but now we know that it's actually very different. So unique that we had to kind of create a, a, a genus for it uh, to be placed in. And um, this is uh, uh, fortunately Kodai Canal International School. And if you are in Kodi, you will find a representation of this bird uh, on these uh, shopping bags, you know. So it is something that is uh, uh, slowly getting popular. Another bird is the laughing thrush, uh, which again um, uh, is very, uh, very interesting bird found only on the mountain tops. Uh, this one is the Nilgiri laughing thrush, but there is the Palani laughing thrush as well, uh, which was first described from Palani Hills. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing about these two birds is that uh, they got to India very long back, about uh, 10, 11 million years back. And uh, they've been on these mountain tops for at least 5 million years. Uh, so this, to put this in perspective, 5 million years, they are endemic on the mountain top. That means that uh, in a scale, uh, a time scale, uh, that uh, humans, the genus Homo, not Homo sapiens, but the genus Homo evolved about two million years back, okay? Our national animal, the tiger, is 0.1 million years, uh, the evolution of that. So evolutionarily, these birds are really old um, and they are found only here, okay? Uh, so uh, these are uh, these, you know, the two groups that I talked about just now, the Sholikola and the Montesincla, uh, the two new genera that we described recently. And you can see that the, these mountain tops in the Western Ghats isolated small mountain tops. That's their only habitat where they are found. So the Pamba Shola is one uh, place where you can find both these species. Uh, so we, we found out this with a lot of work with genetics and we, you know, we say that, okay, these birds are very distantly related uh, from all the other birds. That's why it's so unique. So it is a really, uh, you know, an endemic uh, lineage. This is, uh, I mean, I study birds, so I'm very proud of this. But it's not just birds. There's a lot of uh, biodiversity uh, which are very restricted uh, to this uh, to this landscape. Um, so, and more and more species are found uh, are being described and found here. Ten new frog species uh, and the radiation radiation of shield tailed snakes it was also described uh, just in one year, 2017, when the when the bird was also described. Uh, so, this is a very important landscape. But in this landscape, there is also a lot of anthropogenic fragmentation where uh, uh, islands are being created within these islands. 
uh, that is by uh, various processes. Some, uh, as you can see, is about 100 years uh, old, some landscape change. Um, uh, we also study birds. We know that now birds are uh, singing different songs in response to this uh, habitat uh, changes because naturally the birds have different songs on different mountains. But in addition to that, uh, along isolated fragmented landscapes, they also seem, the songs seem to be slightly different. Uh, but I also want to point out another interesting study which we did uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, multiple partners uh, funded by INTAC. Uh, there are people from ATRI also. Um, uh, and we looked at what is happening to, the, uh, to these mountaintops. And I'm just going to focus on Palni Hills. And uh, here is a map. Uh, and this is a map of Palni Hills, what it would have looked like in 1973. Uh, you need to focus on three colors, the light green, which is natural grasslands, the dark green, which is forest, and the reddish tinge, which is uh, all the reddish tinges are uh, artificial human-made landscapes. The dark red is timber plantation. So this is 1973. And if you follow this, 1981, you can see some changes. 1993, more changes. 2003, even more. And 2014, now you see that a lot of the landscape, almost 60% of the landscape is modified in the Palni Hills. Okay. So um, what I was, and this is from invasion, invasive timber trees that are coming in uh, very rapidly. So, and most of the grassland habitats today are, are, are fragmented. What I want to uh, say is that, so I, we talked about forest species, the grassland species, this one is Nilgiri pipit, is also actually about 7 million years old. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, you have a system here, which is isolated for millions of years, birds that are very unique, found only here and nowhere else in the world. Uh, and this is already impacted by a lot of anthropogenic landscape change. Uh, either by agriculture or invasive trees, which is, uh, you know, we brought them in. Uh, and to that, if you add uh, things like environmental pollution, like mercury and things like that, we don't even understand that. Uh, 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 Nityanand pointed out, pointed out that these birds, the Sholakili, they feed on um, shield tails. That is uh, 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 one, of, one of my students, Viral, um, uh, observed this. They are known to feed on cicadas. Uh, and obviously biomagnification is likely. Unfortunately, we do not have the data uh, uh, to uh, quantify this. Uh, hopefully there will be a time when, you know, uh, when we can do that, at least establish uh, some kind of baselines for future uh, monitoring of some of these uh, uh, effects. So I, I'll end there by uh, pointing out that, you know, the Pambar Shola, the areas that uh, Nityanand talked about, are extremely important because uh, these are some kind of evolutionary hotspots where uh, very, very special, you know, birds, frogs, snakes live. And there is a complex interaction there. Uh, it is being impacted by climate change, anthropogenic landscape change, in addition to which you need to add the mercury and all these other things that are happening. So my apologies uh, again, that I do not have a direct link with mercury. Uh, but uh, you can imagine um, that, you know, some of these things will have uh, impacts. I just want to quickly, um, uh, you know, point out that you can reach out to me on Twitter and all the fantastic photos here are taken by this uh, photographer, Prasenji Tiyadav. Uh, you know, some story about that is also there. So that's about it for, from me, uh, Niti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Robin. That was a fascinating uh, you know, presentation. We were looking more for understanding the magic of what you call the sky islands, uh, not so much on what Mercury would do to it. We will move to the dirty part of the story later, but we just wanted to focus on the sheer beauty and the magic of it. Thank you. Over to you, Jacob. Chiku. That was a wonderful session. Thank you. You, Robin. Uh, we are uh, inviting questions, so please stack them in chat. Uh, Nitin, I'm just directing one, and we're going to paste one of the questions here from Yesu Das. Uh, he had a question about uh, the origins of a Unilever. If you can check the chat, 
Why was Kodikanal chosen for the build? Wasn't it a protected area? Has Unilever ever been sued anywhere around the world? And are there any official cases filed? If not, will the people of Kodikanal sue the company? It's a multi-part question. I'll leave that to you to bat it out. And Okay, I'm just going to take it one at a time. Why was Kodekanal chosen for the build? One, of course, the factory was shut down in a country that was highly, very well regulated. They moved to a country that was that was very poorly regulated. Within this country, Kodekanal was chosen for its uh, uh, cold or cool uh, weather because mercury is a volatile substance that uh, is, exists in liquid form in its natural state, but then it uh, evaporates very easily at room temperature. So places like Chennai would mean that there'd be a lot of mercury vapor, a lot of mercury loss to the environment. And that's a loss to the company. And so a uh, factory was uh, chosen in Kodekanal. Has Unilever been sued anywhere in the world? Yes, they've been sued uh, in all in many places. They have been accused of uh, wiping out rainforests because of palm oil plantations, which India wants to get now, uh, you know, for uh, you know threatening uh, rainforests in Indonesia and other places. Uh, they've been um, they've been sued for uh, workers' rights abuses, for uh, heavy metals in some of the products that they um, they, they use. They've also uh, gotten a lot of negative publicity for their fairness uh, cream, uh, Fair and Lovely, which uh, is uh, seen to be a very racist thing. Um, have there been cases in India? Yes, there have been cases, but I already told you how the courts were totally useless in terms of helping the workers, and the workers had to find help uh, through a viral rap song. Um, the, the issue of uh, environmental contamination also went up to the National Green Tribunal with extremely um, you know, um, unfortunate uh, results. Uh, we will not go back to the courts if we can help it. Yeah, that's it. Great, thank you very much. Uh, there seems to be a follow-up question, which I believe Robin has already addressed. Uh, has the mercury affected the population of both plants and birds. So just I'm gonna just bump that up. Yeah. Uh, well, I can just. Um, uh, I I don't think there is too much data, um, and I think that is that is a little bit of a, a pity. Uh, the only data that is there is what Nityanand pointed out to, and I think Asif will be talking about. So I think that you know that may be the better. Yeah. Okay, great. That's that's all the questions we have for now, Nityanand. Uh, so back is, over to you. Is Jagdish in the room? Yes, he's there. Yeah, um, excellent. Excellent. So I would like to invite Jagdish to uh, start. Uh, uh, Professor Jagdish Prasaswamy, uh, formerly as of today with Atri in Bangalore, uh, mm -hmm. will be moving uh, to a new uh, position. But he's also worked quite a bit in the Western Guards, looking at uh, how rainwater and sediment move uh, you know when it rains sediment moves along with rainwater and a modeling of this and an understanding of this is extremely important for a whole range of things and i'll let uh, jagdish talk a little bit more about it with the specific context of what i can I. thank you jagdish can you uh, both see the screen yes okay so basically um i just want to say what my connection with the uh, kodekanal is uh, I was uh, I worked in the Palmy Hills and in Kodikanal uh, 1991, uh, so that was a long time back, and I made many friends and colleagues there, and I have retained an interest in in the uh, in, in the well-being of of uh, the environment there, and and uh, not as much as I would like to, but I am um, pretty much committed to trying to contribute in any way I can to to uh, solve this really wonderful mosaic of uh, ecosystems and biomes that we have in the Palmy Hills. Um, I am an eco hydrologist and I maintain instrumented sites, long term sites in the upper Nilgiris um, and in Agnashni Basin in Karnataka. But the upper Nilgiris site is, uh, has got a lot of similarities with what uh, we have in Kodekanam because of, of course, the presence of the ecosystems that uh, Professor Robin explained, the Sholas and grasslands. They are common to both the Nilgiris as well as the Palmis. And um, um, and, and the Nilgiris are also similar to, to the Palmy Hills, had a long history of invasion um, by, by water. 
so a lot of similarities in, in terms of the sites. Uh, but my primary data on hydrology, uh, my work uh, usually comes from, from sites where I've had research projects. And I must admit that I haven't actually physically worked on the hydrology of the, the sites that we are discussing today. Uh, however, um, what we did is uh, as a very rapid assessment of the potential for uh, environmental uh, uh, catastrophe or disaster based on what could happen. Now, if you if you recall uh, from from any any of the disasters that that have come from heavy rainfall events in the country, you would re recall that some years back uh, we had about 950 millimeters of rainfall falling in Mumbai in one single day. Uh, Chennai has had two sets of uh, of uh, a very intense rainfall, 225 millimeters in a in a day and a half, and over 150 mm in another day, uh, which have caused devastation. Right. So um, under climate change, um, there has been a lot of uh, changes in the Arabian Sea, in the Indian monsoon system, in, as well as the turnover rate uh, of the of the hydro of the entire hydroclimatic system, which means that the warmer atmosphere uh, leads to, to a very rapid turnover. And this means that we are going to receive rainfall in uh, shorter bouts. Uh, and this is already being seen uh, in many parts of the country. Um, so when we talk about the potential for environmental disaster, it's not the average rainfall that we have to be bothered about. It's not even the, um, even the maximum rainfall that was received in a single day that might have occurred uh, you know, in the last five years or 10 years. It's actually the rainfall that could happen in, in half an hour or one hour. So if you get 50 mm, 100 mm of rainfall in a couple of hours, uh, that could trigger off of something. So the whole risk analysis literature, as you know, is based on the worst possible thing that could happen and how probable is that. So climate change has made these really intense rainfall events um, much more uh, the probability of those occurring in the Kodaikanal area and Pal Palmi Hills has increased. The average in Pal Kodaikanal might be, you know, 2,600 millimeters uh, annually. But uh, all that it takes for a catastrophe to happen is an intense bout of rainfall of a few hundred mm in a day. And when you break that down into the most intense part of the rainfall within the day, it could be, um, it could be, you know, a rainfall of 50, 60 millimeters or 100 millimeters within a couple of hours. So that's basically the context. Um, so um, since we haven't actually collected data on hydrology on the site, what we did was basically look at the characteristics of the site. And I can tell you that most of the stuff that I'm going to be sharing with you is actually work that was done by um, Niti. Uh, I was just helping in and uh, making suggestions that you know when you do a rapid assessment, you want to make sure that it's something that can be replicated by anybody else who has access to the same information. So that was the principle that we followed: is that you know whatever calculations we have made, whatever resources we have used, whatever approximations we have made uh, can be uh, done by anybody else as well. So that was basically the approach we followed. And uh, so the first thing we started was, is that, that you have two scenarios here, that before clear felling and after clear felling of trees. So that's basically a change in land cover um, between before and after type of scenarios. And then there are a few things that we looked at. If you look at the hydrologic cycle, the, um, if you have a rainfall event, the part of that rainfall is going to infiltrate into the soil and that will depend on the soil type, the land cover, the soil organic matter in the, in the and all of that. So we made certain assumptions based on other work that we have done in the Western Guards. So for example, this Bonne et al work um, I was part of is from the uh, Agnashri Basin in Karnataka. Um, some of the work that has been done in the Western Guards elsewhere. And some of my work that I've done in the upper Middle East. So drawing upon that, uh, we were able to look at what might be happening, how much runoff are you likely to get before uh, before the clearing was done and after the trees were removed on this site. So basically we were able to make an estimate that, that using very conservative numbers that we could, we could have enhanced the, um, the runoff from 162 meter cube per hour to about 405 meter cube per hour. So that was, the, um, that was the runoff that would be generated and we have taken very modest things like 25 millimeters an hour, 
uh, 10 millimeters an hour before the clear is coming. And then we have said that the uh, runoff generated would get increased from 10 millimeters an hour to about 25 millimeters an hour after the trees were removed and the vegetation and the soil was disturbed. The second part is, okay, you have this, uh, uh, the runoff that is, that is there, potential runoff that is there. Now, the potential runoff has to interact with um, soil that has been mobilized and can become sediment. So for that, we used a modification of the soil, universal soil loss equation, where based on factors such as the, the type of soil, the texture of the soil, the, the length of the slope on which the site is located, the, the, um, um, the, the slope itself in, in percentage degrees, of, um, and uh, also other things like rainfall erosivity factor, and, and land cover factor. So this is an equation which is available to all science, all science, all soil scientists and uh, citizen scientists around the world. You can plug in the numbers, you can take the appropriate numbers. So it's a, basically it's a, a, a semi, it's an empirical equation based on measurements from around the world, which have been uh, then been put together. So when we applied that to different parts of the site, we were able to then get um, the uh, erosion that could happen in terms of soil per hectare per year, right? So earlier we made an estimate of how much runoff uh, could be generated under the, uh, after the clear felling. Now we are saying, okay, what amount of soil is available to be mobilized by that runoff and taken off the site? So now you can see that in the different parts of that, uh, of the affected area, you have the C1, C2 and A, which is occupied 0.73 hectares, uh, C1 and C2, A occupies 0 0.6, 0 0.16 hectares. So so our estimate of, of the tons of soil per hectare per year before clear filling and after clear filling are, look, are given here. And the soil loss by section, that is adding across, you know, multiplying by the area, total area, uh, before and after is also given. You can see that the tons uh, increase, tons of soil loss increases from 29 to 457 um, in C1. Uh, from 85 tons to over 1,000 tons, 1,355 tons in C2. And in, in section A from 63 to 2009. I mean, that's a huge amount of, uh, of, of soil that could be mobilized because of the disturbance to the site. So, and then we did a bunch of calculations where, where we looked at the, uh, the runoff and then we looked at the available soil. And then we have basically said, okay, we also know that the soil is contaminated with, with mercury, right? So these numbers were given to me uh, from earlier reports. So if you know the concentration of mercury in the soil, and you know uh, the, the, the soil, amount of soil that's going to leave the site, you can make an estimate of how much mercury would, would potentially leave the site in the form of runoff. And that's basically what has been done here. And this is something that you can take a look at uh, later on, but I just want to get to this is something that was uh, is a summary that even Niti has shared with you, and you can see that uh, the mercury, um, you know, we probably would have had about 5.25 kilograms per year before the disturbance, and now that would have potentially got enhanced to 66 kilograms per year uh, after uh, the uh, after the clear filling has happened. Now, this is a huge amount of mercury. So even if you take uh, that with all uncertainty that we attach to our calculations and so on. If even if you take say five, 10, 15, 20%, 25% of this amount as what would have left the site, we are talking about a very serious situation. This amount of mercury, 20 kilograms, 15 kilograms leaving the site and entering into bio, into the soil elsewhere downstream, entering into the atmosphere through other mechanisms, entering into the water, anaerobic conditions, entry, uh, ending up in the Kodekana Lake and, much more important uh, in terms of cascading effects is all that wonderful flora and fauna that uh, Robin, Professor Robin was talking about uh, through mercury, once it becomes methyl mercury, could then principally, uh, could then enter into the food chain uh, from plants to insects, to birds, uh, to mammals and, and so on. And that uh, is a very dangerous situation. So uh, when we invoke the precautionary principle, we should be very, very, um, and we should be treating this as a disaster waiting to happen and plan around that. So our, our whatever assessment that we do should be independent and rigorous 
And clearly, what we need to do immediately is that the surface and subsurface runoff needs to be monitored for, for mercury concentration. And the, then we also then need to do the more difficult task of seeing where this mercury has ended up in. Has it ended up in uh, soil and, and plants in downstream elsewhere, or has it already entered into the higher up in the food chain into birds, reptiles, mammals, and, and, and humans? Um, so this is uh, something that we need to follow up. So we need a thorough independent study of, of these concentrations. Uh, and also then as a basis for um, making a remediation and mitigation plan. And as an environmental scientist, I must say that I hope we are wrong. I hope that we haven't reached the situation where so much of mercury has already left the system based on whatever uh, assessments we have done. I hope that when we actually do the measurements, much of it is still within the site uh, and we can actually uh, take um, have a remediation plan that would take care of it. If, if our worst fears are true, and uh, even if a decent, not a decent, an indecent fraction of, of this um, 66 kilograms has left the site, then we are in pretty serious trouble. So, so I would just like to end here. And uh, I hope that, that uh, we will soon have, um, through a rigorous study, more information and we can we have to link with the need a link between the hydrological study, the sediment study, and the ecological study uh, that needs to be done by uh, people like Professor Robin. All of them need to be connected together because mercury is can affect any part of the environment. Um, and so we we need to do that in in the next few years or maybe even earlier at the earliest opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Krishna Swami, for the very sobering words. Uh, if you could uh, unshare your screen. And uh, then I would like to invite uh, Professor T. Swaminathan, uh, who has been, uh, who's a retired chemical engineer from IIT Madras, currently in Nagpur, the home, the home city of Neri. Uh, and uh, Professor Swaminathan has also served in the State Environmental Impact Assessment Authority and also been part of several expert committees set up by uh, Supreme Court and, and, the, and, the, and, the Madras, uh, and, and the Madras courts. I would like to invite uh, Professor Swaminathan. He's going to talk to us primarily about what it is that Unilever is uh, wanting to do or has gotten approval for in terms of remediation of the mercury contaminated site. Over to you, Professor. Uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks, uh, Niti and uh, Jetka, for uh, for organizing this webinar. Uh, first of all, before uh, I mean, thanks for giving me the real dirty part of the whole uh, issue. And uh, before we make, uh, I mean, I talk about the technology and other uh, related issues. Uh, very interesting, very significant that uh, we have this webinar on Gandhi Jayanti, which just goes on to prove that uh, we are yet to achieve real freedom. The colonialism has shifted from one nation to multi nation now. Uh, the second point I'm sorry, I would like to just uh, mention before uh, I go into the details is contaminated site, uh, site remediation is not a new issue in India. There have been several uh, uh, cases of contaminated soil which are lying still contaminated for several years. That even after 20 years, we are still talking about correct corner. We are just only talking about it. In, in itself shows what is the level of uh, seriousness with which these issues are being handled. Having said that, uh, let me talk a little bit about the technology that is being uh, discussed about now. Uh, the, in, when we look at any uh, decontamination technology, uh, we have to keep primary, first in mind the primary contaminant that has to be removed. Uh, so in any, any such treatment uh, technology, there are several options that are available. And Unilever has chosen to uh, uh, chosen, selected this particular technology where they are uh, going to uh, remove the soil uh, from, from the site and physically remove it 
uh, clean it, go through the whole process, and then uh, take it to a treatment, which is a thermal uh, treatment, which is called retarding. Uh, from that, they would try to remove this uh, mercury from the soil and uh, then put back the soil from, the, from where it was excavated. Okay. Uh, let me just try and share uh, the screen for a moment. No. And can you see the we can see your your desktop your screen yeah yeah one yeah can you see that can you see the process yes if you can make it a bit bigger uh, so, on, the, on the bottom right corner you can see a scale 100 percent oh yeah yeah okay okay i'll do that okay. use that yeah you can take it up a little bit Oh, too much. That's good. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So essentially, we take the contaminated soil, go through a whole series of material handling where size separation um, uh, is done, then it's washed. Then, after washing, the five or uh, the, the water is separated, then the pines are taken to the thermal dissolver or the vacuum retort. And the, then the gases which go from there is processed uh, through a uh, scrubbing system. Then it goes to a condenser where the mercury is condensed, the liquid mercury is recovered. The rest of the gas is uh, either it can be passed to an adsorption stage and then uh, disposed. And the uh, uh, mercury removed soil, it is verified, verified that most of the mercury is removed, and then it is disposed, which is back, it is supposed to be backfilled back into the area where from where it was excavated. Okay. The whole concept is based on the fact that the mercury is going to be absorbed on the pipes, and most of the pipes can be easily removed. Okay. Uh, but it is not essentially only the pipes that will be absorbing the material, there will be other organic material and other silty material which will also be absorbing them. So the process requires a lot of uh, handling uh, before it can actually be separated. So what, from the results that uh, we have seen with the pilot uh, studies that have been done, that we can see very clearly even the uh, removal, the soil uh, processing itself is not complete. So the efficiency of this process is quite questionable. But because mercury is highly volatile, it is usually, this kind of method is usually preferred, that thermally you can uh, dissolve it and collect it. So this, this particular uh, process that has been uh, adopted by Unilever uh, requires complete excavation of the contaminated areas. So if you look at the, the total area that uh, we covered and where it has actually spread out, the amount of uh, soil that has to be removed and processed and then the amount of energy that has to go into the uh, recovery process are all quite high. So this aspect, I don't know whether, I mean, the assessment, whether, what kind of assessment has been done to select this technology. But as of now, from the results that have been obtained from the uh, uh, pilot studies, it doesn't seem to be very encouraged. The another as challenging aspect of this uh, process, the treatment technology, is that the uh, Water that the uh, when the soil is from, uh, even though the solubility is low, a lot of mercury is actually lost into the water. So the water that is finally it will become a waste water. It still require it still become another uh, uh, waste product, hazardous product, and that has to be treated. 
and treatment technology for wastewater to remove mercury is again based either on uh, precipitation, which will result in a lot of floods, or in adsorption, which will result in an, another adsorbent material, which has to be which will become hazardous and which has to be again disposed. So essentially, the process trans transfers the mercury from the soil matrix into the wastewater and again into a soil matrix. So the whole lot of uh, as all these aspects have to be really looked into in terms of evaluating the feasibility of this technology. So, well, the question then comes, what, what are the alternatives? Do they exist? Yes, but uh, there are several alternatives that are available, uh, which, which, which is uh, whether it could be either in situ and where, uh, as far as possible, you know, in, in such contaminated sites, particularly when such when they are in such high gradient slopes, it is preferable to go for some kind of an inside uh, on-site uh, removal mechanism. So uh, there should have been, probably uh, there are other options that are available, which could uh, do an in situ by remediation, which involves it could also involve thermal process. It could also involve phytoremediation or bioremediation. So options are available. So we, 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 if that kind of insight remediation technologies had been used, a lot of uh, problems that arise out of the uh, movement of the sediment could be avoided. Uh, this is basically my uh, submission. And uh, if there are any questions, I would certainly be happy to have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. If you can unshare your screen. Yeah. And I would like to invite now uh, uh, Professor Asif, Asif Qureshi from IIT Hyderabad, who's worked on mercury. And he has worked on mercury even in Antarctica. He's been part of the expedition to Antarctica and uh, has also done some uh, basic uh, studies, uh, not very detailed, but uh, he will also speak about that from Kodekanal and the plains below. Um, Asif. Okay, thank you, Nidhi. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can see the slide now. So, uh, well, this particular presentation, I made We it... can't see your uh, slide. What slide do you have? It's just our desktop. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Swaminathan, you need to unshare your screen, please. Yeah, one second. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Hold on. Okay. No, you, you need to say stop sharing. No, it's not coming. Uh, Chiku, would you be able to help? Let me let me give it a shot. Yeah, yeah, I got. It. Okay, yeah. all right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Yeah, Asif, over to you again. Asif. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I hope you can see the slide now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is the topic that I was. Uh, going to talk on. So what should we be looking for in Palmer Shola? And previous talks have already given uh, a background on the uh, on the ecology, like the history of Kodai Canal issue and the ecology of Kodai Canal and also the potential runoff from the mercury laden soil to the forest. So I'm going to move forward with that. So first, what happens if mercury goes on? So this is just a file forest picture. So, you know, this is kind of the soil runoff happening. Uh, it's coming from outside the forest, maybe from the factory. So I coming to the forest soil. And here you have several bunch of reactions. So you have this direct emissions from factory and then sediment runoff from factory soil after the, well, during and after the closure. So once it is there, there are several uh, species groups of mercury. So elemental mercury, which is the volatile form, which undergoes long range transport also. So, you know, transport from air upstream to the forest and from forest to downstream. Then the divalent part, which is the plus two oxidation state. And then there is the methylation of this divalent part. So methylated mercury. 
and this methylated mercury is the thing that is bioaccumulated in the food chain at the same time you have this uptake into the roots of the trees happening and then of course when the later fall is happening mercury is transported back to the soil there is exchange between soil and air or vegetation and air as well so this is a pretty sort of uh, detail uh, complex or you know very cyclic and continuously interactive process that is happening and the problem is basically the methylated form which uh, we will look at now so this is our bioaccumulation of methyl mercury in soil and again we have seen the primer already so you know the soil food chain or food web so we have in our case we have the methylated mercury in the organic matter in soil or attached to soil particles or you know in bit more dissolved form it's uptaken by trees then all the soil based microorganisms earthworms and then eventually you know it goes to higher trophic level species which consume these lower trophics worms and even plants or dead decaying organic matter and for example in this case i'm going to the birds you know follows what i have done earlier also so birds so another thing about mercury is that in addition to being bioaccumulated so bioaccumulated bioaccumulation means a species is consuming mercury or through its diet for example but it is not eliminating it as fast as it is consuming it so it accumulates within the body so one is that so methylated mercury is quite prone to bioaccumulation in living beings then biomagnification is as we move up the food chain it has also been of observe that the concentration of mercury as we go up the food chain in trophic level species it's so it also bio magnifies so there is a higher burden at heat trophic level and then so what do we know about the birds and mercury not necessarily could i can somewhere else so exposure so whatever the bird or the species is eating exposure is of course reflected in body tissues blood feathers and eggs for human beings also whatever we consume there is a effect on the body so it's the same thing here so the harmful effects occurs sort of in two categories i categorize one is the individual itself and also the reproductive success the reproduction of the species so at the individual level uh, so the thing is the exposure also need not be lethal the, the bird doesn't have to die it's a chronic exposure and chronic effects so harmful effects are even possible at the sub lethal exposure time for example it compromises the high energy behavior so like more lethargy or more latency and some other change Uh, like these kind of abnormalities, which could probably be linked to neurological function. <clears throat> so we have this behavior abnormality. So the exposure is influencing the individual itself. I some <laughs> example case studies I have just recently found from like elsewhere. So in the lab study of Hello. No, no, your 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 voice was breaking a bit, but now it's okay. I will okay. turn off my video. I think maybe yes, that's the bandwidth issue. So yes, okay. So in a lab study of songbirds, which was given diet laden with methyl mercury, what they these people observed, these scientists observed is at all doses, the reproductive success of the species were reduced, and at the lowest dose they tried, the offspring. uh sort of success this was reduced by 16% and the highest dose which was still half of the lethal dose reduced the number of offspring by 50% compared to the baseline uh basically it was less number of chicks that were fledging from the nest maybe robin would have like more uh, visualization of what is happening so the number of chicks that were fledging from the nest are much fewer even adults showed sharp increase in latency to re-nest after loss of a clutch So this was like individual level as well as the future level effects. 
and there was another review studies uh, about they they reviewed more than 100 studies and in 72% of field studies that they reviewed and 91% of last studies there was some effect of mercury exposure at some end point and there was a conclusion here that the bird population declines may already be resulting from environmental mercury pollution so it is something that is already happening it's not like waiting to happen it has probably already happening in in the sites that they reviewed so you can make the extension so this is something that may already be happening so this is the observational stuff i will put a little bit more quantitative aspect on this so what kind of quantitative information people gather so some uh, scientists have observed that the at feather mercury levels between 5 and 65 microgram per gram which is 155 to 65 ppm it was associated with sublethal and reproductive effects and they have also measured mercury in egg contents and there was another threshold for that <clears throat> and here again from the review paper i have there were several figures i picked out this uh, figure itself this is the blood equivalent mercury concentrations in birds among different eco regions of western north america so this is this contains about 1700 birds <clears throat> and what is a blood equivalent concentration basically they have used some equations to convert the concentration of mercury in tissues feathers or organic or, or body organs to a equivalent blood concentration so that they can combine all these studies and compare them in a consistent framework so this is the figure and then they have like the tropical forest and tundras and this is basically piscivorian birds so in several of the places, the threshold has been exceeded. Uh, the threshold, the risk red color is 0.2 ppm blood equivalent concentration, which is the lowest observed effect level. This is the lowest concentration at which an effect has been observed. And of course, there were some other thresholds also measured there, 1, 3, and 4 ppm blood equivalent, which correspond to moderate, high, and severe risk. And of course, like as we have already listened to that for the particular case of Kodai Canal, I, there is, we don't have such numbers, whereas right now the information, the quantitative information exists to which uh, numbers can be compared to now. So with this point, I will come to the end that what could be done in, in the case of Kodai Canal. So more like a hard on-ground risk assessment, which means like uh, real numbers from the field. So if we want to target like, you know, influences on so many, uh, you know, prehistoric species that are still there and endemic to this region. And if there is a reproductive effect happening, then that's not good because there's nothing like the species will go away, right? So some things that are very important for this on-ground kind of risk assessment in terms of uh, the species is, the analysis of the present body burden of the target species. So if birds, it could be like body feathers or down feathers, uh, tissue or slash blood, it's, it's more like, uh, you know, you need permission from wildlife, but feathers, I guess, can be collected or gathered later. Then comparison of the mercury levels in these um, media, in these uh, tissues or, or uh, biomarkers, with the observed toxicological thresholds, either related to the feather itself, which was 5 to 65 ppm, or a conversion to blood equivalent in comparison with these thresholds. And then one can characterize it that what is the level, present level, is it a NOL or you know, moderate risk or high risk? So that's one stage. There's another possibility to extend this even more that, you know, if in an ideal world, you would even do a correlation with the mercury burdens to actual performance, individual performance or reproductive performance of the species itself. And to augment it, so this is very specific to the birds I'm writing right now, what could be done. And then when we, to augment it, we would also look at the ecological food chain, so like soil, soil sediments, vegetation, and other biota that form the base of the food chain. And whatever happens, we need more systematic and regular duration of studies so that we actually know what is happening and you know, we have a better understanding of things. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Asif. And uh, with that, we come to the end of the presentations and uh, the floor is open for questions. I hand it over to Chiku uh, and or Jacob. Uh, Nitinan, we have compiled the questions and sent it to you on your WhatsApp. If you can just look at that, it'll make it easier for you. We've put them name-wise with, with that help. We can read them out to you if you like. Uh, yes, the reading out will be better. Sure. So we have a question from Krishna. I, and I think uh, uh, this presentation by Dr. Asif would have addressed it. Uh, if you missed anything, I'm just going to read that out for that. I am living near Pamba Shola. Could have a local for 20 years, over 20 years. The place is populated. Obviously, we are exposed to mercury. What can we do to protect ourselves? What can the residents of Kodekanal do? There is very little awareness on the matter. I'm going to just ping that uh, question here just for everyone to read it as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, I will take the thing on what can the residents of Kodekanal do, but if somebody else can answer about the mercury vapor, probably Asif. Okay, let me go ahead first. Uh, no, what can the residents of Kodekanal do? It, I think it is important for the residents to ask questions of the Pollution Control Board, the District Forest Officer, and the Government of Tamil Nadu as to why why people have been left unaware, where why there is no data on any of these things. The only data that is there is from uh, Unilever. And um, at, at an, in, in one instance where I actually tried to get scientists to sign on, there were scientists from Kodekanal who said that there is not sufficient information that I have not been able to sufficiently establish that uh, Unilever is polluted. The thing has to be shifted the other way around. The burden of proof is on Unilever and the government of Tamil Nadu to assure us that this is not a problem. And that can only be done scientifically by kind of generating the information that uh, Jagdish, uh, Robin and Asif were talking about uh, and saying that, yes, the worst case scenarios that have been painted by a number of people or people have been worried about is actually not true. Here is the data that shows that. So you need to ask for ecological risk assessment by independent scientists. Niri is a consultant of Unilever. Niri cannot be asked to do this. Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board in this case is an accused party because in the last 21 years, despite being asked to, they have not really um, done anything worthwhile. The forest department has to be the most worried. And I would suggest that you uh, address your concerns to the chief wildlife warden of the forest department through any means that you can, including through um, you know, the State Board of Wildlife. I think there is a person from Kodekanal who's part of the State Board of Wildlife. Please upscale it and have the government get more interested and have the people of Kodekanal realize that this is something that will not just harm Pambarshola if it is a problem. Let us all hope that it is not, but if it is a problem, it will harm Pambarshola and it will harm even the downstream places. But we can't say that what we don't know won't hurt us. What we don't know can hurt us. So it'll be useful to know. Uh, regarding whether mercury in the air is likely to hurt people who are living nearby, I would ask Asif to clarify. Okay, uh, so the question was, mercury is highly volatile. Can it spread to nearby cultivation area like tea plantation? I'm, yeah, I, I'm not sure if like that much mercury is emitted in, like if it's particulate, it will probably deposit in the surrounding area. And if a tree plantation is like several kilometers away, I, you would be more worried about runoff of mercury and then trans, like travel either immediately or over time. So, you know, it deposits on the stream, then resuspends in the next rain and then like a hopping thing, it can just move like that. Uh, you have to see that once it's emitted to the air, the air is also flowing at some rate, let's say it's also diluting it. If you are looking at 10 to 1, so there is also a dilution happening because the site is small and the area is quite wide, right? So the dilution is also happening. Uh, but I would be more thinking about runoff of, of mercury from soil and then, uh, you see, mercury is an element, so it's not going to go away. So it will just be converted from one form to another. So it's on the soil, it may be re in at a future time. And then over time, it might, you know, go to all, anything that receives downstream runoff is a possible receptor. But whether it's going to be a risk or not, you would have to check. Yeah. Uh, Jagdish, do you have anything to add about 
the primary route of risk from mercury in the factory site? Is it air, water? Yeah, so that depends uh, on, you know, as we, we've made some estimates, rapid assessment of the potential of runoff to, to mobilize uh, uh, contaminated soil, mercury contaminated soil. So what we don't know is how much has already left the site. If, and uh, so uh, that's what there's one that's one source of uncertainty. The second one is, as uh, Dr. Asif has also explained, you know, the further you get away from the site, so let's say that some runoff left uh, the site a few years ago, um, then it would already be in depending on the uh, aerobic, anaerobic, um, and all the uh, oxidation reduction status of the different. Uh, the sediment, soil, and other that through which that, that mercury is passing, uh, it can take many other forms. And it would then, once it enters a biota, uh, so in the plants which are, which are growing in, uh, along the streams and or, 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 or uh, that trees, uh, the tree roots are, say, uh, tapping um, surface, uh, surface, uh, subsurface water, moisture. So that's one place where we might find mercury. But if it is entered higher up in the food chain, now birds can go very far away from the site. And then in some sense, they are spreading the problem to new populations and new sites uh, as well. Um, and then that would show up in the reproductive failure or in um, um, you know, lack of recruitment uh, in certain types of, some types of birds might be more susceptible to this than others, uh, depending on the feeding yield that they belong to. Um, you know, whether they're grain eating birds or they're insectivorous birds. And we also know that even birds which uh, say sip nectar as, a, as an adult, they feed uh, their uh, chicks with spiders and insects when they are young the, for, for getting the protein. Um, so, so, so in that sense, I think we really need to have a, a very rigorous, well-designed sampling, uh, spatially explicit, uh, taking into account what we know about how far mercury can move uh, through various means, whether through water, through the air, through biota, and uh, and then finally, uh, of course, the human uh, population uh, that is that might interact with both the wildlife and the soil and plants, but also separately through the mechanism of, of volatilized mercury entering uh, the human food chain as well. Um, so that is, I think, the <laughs> the scope of what we need to study is quite uh, large, and the sooner we do it, the better chances we have of, of containing the damage. And hopefully, as you have also mentioned, we will get some good news if you're lucky that much of the mercury is already, is, or is, 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 has not uh, left the site, which gives us an opportunity to do, to, to contain the damage within the site with, with easier remediation um, compared to what we may have to do if it has gone far away from the site. Thank you. Uh, we have another set of questions from Mark, um, which I think Dr. T. Swaminathan has addressed. We hope to hear about a solution to the physical problem and any legal measures involved in the latest developments on the site itself. Second part is, is there any funding coming for mercury measuring in Kodai Canal uh, locals, for locals, human and animal? Okay. Uh, so the question about... Uh any legal developments, there is a legal development. After, so in, in June 2021, uh, we published uh, you know, a, a report which was picked up by the media about the uh, ongoing mercury contamination and violation by Unilever of uh, <clears throat> the National Green Tribunal's orders. And the National Green Tribunal in Chennai uh, took up a SOMOTU case. And that case was uh, heard, they formed a committee, the committee had CPCB and uh, TNPCB, and then they've also submitted a report by NIRI, the data of which I've already shared. The data is points to a need for concern, but the conclusions of NIRI is that all is well. Um, the National Green Tribunal, I think that we will probably be intervening in some manner, we don't know, uh, but then this is something that is also a violation of the Wildlife Protection Act, because in the Wildlife Protection Act under section 29, it says that streams and uh, water bodies entering uh, the wildlife sanctuary should not be altered. 
the, 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 the stream flow, the water flow into wildlife sanctuaries should not be enhanced or reduced. The act of deforestation has effectively enhanced stream flow, as was demonstrated by Jagdish. Uh, these are all opportunities, but one should approach courts with great hesitation uh, because uh, courts will uh, employ experts and experts are not always uh, you know, working only on the basis of science. There are many other considerations. And so the better platform would be the political platform where you get the forest department, which has uh, an enlightened leadership at this point to take action, to ensure that uh, the artists are aware of what is happening in the uh, sanctuary. In terms of, is there any funding coming? There's no funding coming for anything. And if, if, you, if you're looking for funding, then one has to really make a case for it. I'm hopeful that the, um, uh, the uh, experts that we have here today are people who will get into conversation and uh, you know uh, uh, present something uh, to uh, the authorities or wherever to be able to uh, do long-term studies. Uh, because the expertise that we need is here in this room and it's like amazing uh, stuff that we've already heard. So that's the answer to that. Is there, was there a science aspect to the question? What did we answer that? Um, no. The Mark has another question, which is, can Unilever be ordered by the court to fund research on mercury levels in our bodies, insects, birds, animals? Yes. And best, yeah, yeah, that is firstly one part of the question, yeah. Now the answer is yes. It doesn't even have the court. Actually, the pollution control board has the has the powers uh, because the pollution control board implements the Environmental Protection Act, and the Environmental Protection Act in Indian jurisprudence is very clear that the polluter pays. And in this case, the, the Unilever can be asked to deposit a certain amount, and that amount can be used for all kinds of studies. Unilever can be penalized because that is also there within the liability for cleanup of contaminated sites approved by the government of India. But none of this is being done. The reason why none of this is being done is nobody is asking for it. Uh, Kodekanal has been remarkably silent in voicing out a concern about the ongoing contamination. And this is also an effort to try and um, you know, uh, provide more information that there is reason for concern and it would be useful to be concerned and direct your concern towards the government. And as Jagdish and Asif have pointed out, we might be pleasantly surprised that our concern was baseless, that things are okay. If that is the case, we will all be happy. But if that isn't, then we are exposing ourselves to future dangers. Well, there was a science part of the question, Mark's asking uh, specifically to Dr. Swaminathan, can magnets be used uh, for cleanup? Because mercury is uh, the word he would use, mag magnetosensitive. Can magnets uh, be used? Yeah. Uh, magnet, I, I, as far as, as to the best of my knowledge, no uh, contamination technology, decontamination technology has used magnets. There are in situ techniques like uh, um, uh, electro electrokinetic uh, movement, which have been used, but in placing in situ electrodes to sort of uh, collect the contaminants at certain locations and then uh, removing them. But these are all only experimental. Okay, they have not been uh, proved to be commercially viable. And uh, in a place like Kodekanal, where steep uh, gradients are there, this kind of technologies are not very easy to adopt. Uh, but beyond that, basically, uh, the uh, the technology that the Unilever has adopted, uh, I don't see any kind of uh, technological and vi viability assessment that has been done beforehand to select this technology. Uh, most of the time, it would have been ideal to go for an in-situ remediation technology, uh, which is uh, which would uh, uh, sort of reduce a uh, lot of other problems that are, that we are seeing today, which, which could have been totally avoided. And in fact, this 20 years, if an in-situ remediation technology had been adopted much earlier, probably we would have not seen much of 
the uh, military constitution at all reaching for Basola. So right time, which should have been adopted, and even now, it's probably not too late to look at uh, a better technology. I hope I made it clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Rohita, skipping that here. Rohita asks, how will the draft EIA 2020 impact the current situation in Kodekanal? Does it strengthen Unilever's presence? Uh, neither the draft EIA 2020 nor the existing EIA uh, notification 2006 have anything to do with remediation. They should, because remediation of contaminated, contaminated sites often involves as much, if not more, disturbance and potential for environmental contamination uh, than even the setting up of a greenfield uh, factory. Uh, but however, um, the uh, you know, uh, remediation of contaminated sites has not been included uh, in the environmental impact assessment notification. In fact, uh, right from uh, the Bhopal gas disaster and the site over there, there has been a consistent demand that environmental impact assessments must be done and the public must be consulted because if the public had been consulted, then the people in Kodekanal would, would have access to all this information and would, if they choose to, uh, be able to um, weigh in on that. Uh, but what is not guaranteed by the environmental impact assessment uh, for all of India can still be demanded for Kodekanal by the people if they put the right kind of pressure on the government uh, uh, to have this information published and to have a public hearing and to, uh, you know, uh, to, to see what can be done in the coming days. Lovely. Uh, just following up on that, Vaishnavi asks, is there a reason why the community is silent in Kodekanal? Is it because of a lack of local organizations uh, available for mobilizations or what are the possible reasons? Uh, I don't know. Are there any people from Kodekanal who can take the answer? You can chat. Uh, I don't know. I, I think it might be a lot to do with uh, fatigue. It might be to do with uh, the fact that they don't see, because there's a lack of information, uh, don't see this as a huge problem. Unfortunately, Mercury actually looks quite beautiful. And the factory site looks even more beautiful. It looks like for a person from Chennai, it looks like a, a resort. And uh, so all these things may, and you know, as the, uh, strangely enough, the, the Central Pollution Control Board and the Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board have submitted a report to the National Green Tribunal in which they said that we have visited the site and we have walked along the Pambar Shola and we see no visible signs of effects on birds and animals and plants. This, when, when we have people like Asif and uh, Robin talking about sublethal effects, reduction in, in, in reproductive uh, success, here we have our top regulators, the Central Pollution Control Board and the Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board, looking for gross effects like deformed legs and you know two-headed snakes and things like that to uh, snakes. So the, the problem might also be, to answer your question, might be that mercury is not the kind of poison that say methyl isocyanate was. And so there's probably a complacency or a, a, a belief that the problem is not very serious. And we hope that through this kind of a conference, we would be able to present more evidence to a local organization. There are very good local organizations over there. In fact, I told you this matter came to light with Pali Hills Conservation Council. And these are people with capacity, a lot of good science and a very good network. So I think that it is a matter of, uh, you know enough awareness. Uh, it is not a it is not a matter of intent. But definitely, people are interested in in safeguarding the local environment. Let me carry back the board. Yes, please. Hello. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, see, essentially, whenever wherever we have this contaminated site, uh, people get alarmed only when there is a visible sign of the pollution that is taking place. Like, for example, if there is a coloured water coming or if there is a very strong smell uh, uh, that, that comes out, then people get alarmed and they start seriously thinking about it and questioning about it. But otherwise, most of the contaminated sites have been there for a long time 
in, and nobody bothers about them. Even the regulatory agencies have not taken any serious action about this. So uh, this also relates to the earlier one. Somebody asked whether people of Kodakana should be concerned about this. So if you look at, if you monitor the exposure routes, like food, water, and air, and find out the levels of uh, mercury in all these things, you can understand the impact, I mean, the significance of the problem, seriousness of the problem. If that is immediate, then one can look at immediate action that can be taken. But, but my suspicion is that people have not, since the data is not, information is not available, people are not really understanding this importance of this problem. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Danny, which is related to the data. Is there any recent data collected from and around the site, which is public? If not, can we support an independent study and data collection? Uh, there is, as I said, uh, one study has been submitted uh, on, in August 2021, actually submitted to the court in September 2021, a few days ago. And that study is available online. It has been done by NIRI. I have referred to that study in my last few slides. Um, uh, however, that's a very uh, poor study and most of NIRI studies are consistent in being of poor quality. Uh, a, a, a public study, a, a public funded study and a good study is definitely a need of the hour and one needs to look for options with that. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Nityanand. Uh, so I'm just going to share a link here. Yeah, some I'm going to share a link here. It's a learning assessment form. If you could just spend like uh, 10 seconds, everyone, to just uh, rate the session before your knowledge before and after the session and how you could recommend us to improve. We would really appreciate that input. Uh, all this data will be uh, shared publicly. Uh, Nithyanand has also shared codingmercury.org. Please check that out. While you're not doing this, I'm going to invite my uh, colleague, the campaigner who's working on this, Rashmi. I'd invite you to just come and talk, just talk about the campaign that uh, you've been running from jatka.org. Uh, you can just share it with the, the audience, please. Welcome on board. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, hi. So with Niti's help, we at Jhatka.org have launched this campaign asking Unilever as well as the chief minister to take immediate action. Uh, so far, we have received more than 13 case signatures and the numbers are continuously increasing. We've also submitted a copy recently to their Mumbai office and acknowledging that they have said that their legal team is going to get in touch with us next week. We're going to push the campaign forward, try to build pressure on all stakeholders. And I'd request all of you to sign the petition. If you have already signed, then do share it among your circles. Thank you. In, in our work in citizen mobilization, uh, we look at the bare minimum that you can contribute uh, to a campaign like that is to sign a petition and campaigners like Rashmi will take this or uh, take your signature and your name to the uh, relevant decision makers. Uh, one of our campaigners walked into the office earlier this week, in fact, in Mumbai. Uh, we'll share that story uh, later. But right now, uh, you know, there are people who are willing to come out and protest. There are people willing to do investigative reports people willing to attend a talk, but there are a lot of people, the majority is just willing to give like 30 seconds to one minute, make sure that the people around you sign this petition. That's the only way we can get the masses to participate in simple, quick ways uh, at the bare minimum. So that link has been shared again. I'm gonna again share that learning assessment form because it's extremely important for us to create high quality uh, 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 sessions like this. A big thanks to Nitin and Jairam for making this possible and putting uh, this great, uh, powerful panel together. It was extremely, I think you brought together a lot of questions and answers into a single 90 minute session very effectively. Thank you for that. I learned a lot. Uh, before we close it, uh, can you, I'm just gonna wait for you to take that learning assessment form. And uh, we're going to sign off. Any more last thoughts before we close it for today? The session will be stored on Facebook, on our Facebook page. Uh, all our social media is at the rate chatka, D-O-T-O-R-G. So you can share that content from there. So anyone else who wants to know about the issue, it's available there. Nityana? One last thing, um, yeah, Mark, uh, Mark Antrobus from PHCC Kodekanal had said that he would 
put pressure on, on pollution control board. I think that that's fantastic. But also, please uh, uh, write or speak to uh, Chief Wildlife Warden Forest Department office because they will be uh, receptive because it is their property that we've been talking about. Their property, our property, but in their custody that we've been talking about. Thank you very much uh, to the four panelists and to Jatka for organizing this and for the wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to be stopping the recording and the live streaming now.